from Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you, and here's what's ahead. K-State's Sarah Lancaster will talk about how delayed corn and soybean planting, or replanting, impacts you growers' weed control programs and what adjustments might be necessary. Then we'll hear from the three Kansas FFA members who earned the distinction of stars over Kansas during the 2021 Kansas FFA State Convention last week. Remarks from Wesley Denton, Jay McClure, and Nicole Hazy. And on this week's wildlife management segment later on, K-State's Charlie Lee reports on a promising rat control product which is generally harmless to off-target species. All that and more next on Agriculture Today. This is the Tuesday edition of Agriculture Today on the K-State Radio Network. Thanks once more for being along with us. As you might imagine, we've had a few twists and turns in crop weed management of late with the delays in field work and even subsequent delays in planting those crops and how that affects you producers' abilities to fend off weed infestations now. Sarah Lancaster is going to offer some thoughts on that and other matters of interest. She is a weed management specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Primarily, Sarah, there's more than a little replanting of corn for sure, maybe even soybeans out there. This can result in a complication in weed control, can't it? That's right, Eric. So I had some emails last week from some folks who were concerned about how they needed to approach replanting corn, destroying their original corn stand that was not satisfactory so they could replant corn. When you think about it, Tillage might not be a bad option if you're, you're able. I know that some folks worry a little bit about, you know, what that does to the residual herbicides they already had down. But honestly, Eric, if they've had enough rain that they're needing to replant their corn for those reasons, that residual herbicide is gone anyway. Um, so that's kind of a non-factor in the decision-making process from my perspective. If tillage isn't an option... You know, herbicides can come into play there. Depending on what your pre-emergence program was, switching to soybeans might not be a bad idea, um, especially given the date on the calendar and then the ability to go ahead and control any volunteer corn in those beans. We have a lot more options for that um, if we switch to soybeans there. If you want to stick with corn, there is some Enlist corn out there. I do not have a good feel for the availability of hybrids that would be adapted to our area, but you know that potentially could be an option if someone could get a hold of that. That would allow for control of that volunteer corn using the germinicide, the Assure component of that herbicide resistance package to control the Roundup Ready Liberty Link corn um, that you're trying to get rid of. Otherwise, you know, really you're looking at something like a Paraquat probably. Um, to burn down any existing stands of corn. If you wanted to try to heat that paraquat up a little bit with some uh, metribuzin or atrazine, that could be beneficial because if the corn is still pretty small, that paraquat may not kill the growing point. And so you may still have a volunteer corn problem after you spray. Um, So adding the photosynthetic inhibitor, the group five product like metribuzin or atrazine can be helpful. And interestingly enough, there's also just a smidgen of research. This is this is a sort of a gee whiz, Eric, more than a <laughs> <laughs> more than a, you know a hard and fast recommendation here. But there's some evidence that says that applying germoxone or Paraquat in the evening actually leads to statistically better control of volunteer corn than applying it in the morning. Now, what's happening there? So the way that Paraquat works, photosynthesis needs to be happening in order to create the stuff that ends up making the cells leak out and the plant die. So when you apply in the evenings, photosynthesis, or closer to evening, right, you have that period of time where the Paraquat is actually a little bit more available to move throughout the plant, um, and and you just slow that process down um, and get a little bit better kill. So... 
you know, interesting folks that are farming large acres obviously don't have the luxury of waiting until evening to cover their grounds. But, you know, something that folks might be interested in being aware of. Yeah. You've been talking mostly here about that volunteer corn infesting a following soybean crop, a replacement crop here. What about regular weeds and some of the issues that may have been drummed up because, again, of the persistently saturated fields? Yeah. So, you know, even if you want to keep that corn stand, Eric, you're still going to have to face the fact that your pre-emergence herbicide in a lot of areas of the state is probably effectively gone. Right. We've had enough rain that it's moved out of that effective zone in the soil. So, you know, you're looking at shorter windows of residual activity and having to be super timely with those post-emergent applications. You know, I know a lot of folks, the last I looked at the USDA numbers, Kansas was reported at like 52 percent planted or something like that. I did not check this morning to see what they reported last week, but there's a lot of guys trying to do a lot of things at once. Right. Um, but if you let particularly those Palmer amaranth and water hemp, you know, those particularly difficult to control weeds, if you let them get much more than four inches, you're going to have a tough time controlling them. Mm-hmm. So your post-emergence treatment of choice, would it vary from the norm at all? What? So this would be a situation where that idea of the overlapping residual becomes really important and in including a residual product in with that post-emergent application because you have, again, depending on how much rainfall you've had, um, you potentially could have very little of that pre-emergent residual herbicide left in your field. And so you would that would be a situation, you know, the high rainfall um, situation where you would see an economic benefit probably to using that residual <laughs> That applies well for soybeans beyond just volunteer corn control? Yeah, I mean, so I'm thinking more, you know, in our corn programs, right? The corn has really come on. The weeds in that corn have really come on. You know, if you have soybeans in the ground, it would apply to those as well. As we think about the soybeans that are just going in the ground, you know, like my crew is hustling hard trying to get the rest of our soybeans in, um, particularly our extend soybeans, extend flex soybeans. Um, to beat that June 30th deadline there. But even in those soybeans that are already in, considering that residual, that additional residual in your post-emergent herbicide application is going to be beneficial this year. And you mentioned it. There is a deadline coming up, the end of this month, for those uh, dicamba applications. There is a cutoff date for the applications. That's right. So we're talking about the -the over-the-top applications of dicamba formulation. So that's three products that are available. You've got Extendamax, Ingenia, and Tabium um, that will be affected by this. And there is a June 30th cutoff for applications there. And so, you know, with the late soybean plantings, um, that might mean, you know, folks are looking at putting those applications out at a little earlier soybean growth stage than they might have intended um, originally with their plans. But there's a lot of data Um, that I've seen that says that, you know, dicamba has a fit at planting. So something to keep in mind for guys that are considering double crop soybeans um, after their wheat, if they get their wheat harvested here in the next next little bit and can get in before that June 30th cutoff, um, there's definitely a place for those products in in the at planting or pre-emergent slot. Um, as well as, you know, we've done a lot of trials looking at very early applications like um, unifoliate to, to v, B1, B3 applications of those dicamba products. And, and again, good weed control, largely because you're timely with your weeds mm-hmm. in relation to your, your weed height. Awfully tight window if you're double cropping beans after oh, wheat, man. though, <laughs> isn't it? It is a super tight window, right? And, you know, with this wet spring, I would imagine that a lot of the wheat crop has been kind of pushed back a little bit. Right. You know, it's going to depend on field to field and variety to variety, what folks are able to do. You know, we kind of anticipated that the extent system might not be a great fit for double crop soybeans in Kansas specifically for that reason. If you think about kind of typical wheat harvest dates, that doesn't leave us a lot of time there to use that system. And so then, you know, you're looking at either buying extend flex soybeans and relying on the Liberty or switching over to the Enlist system if you want to be able to use that um, growth regulator herbicide um, as part of your post-emergence program there. No shortage on strategizing here, obviously. <laughs> the, the, the sky's the limit. <laughs> 
and want to finish on one thing here, and because of this whirlwind of of technology out there in weed control and uh, seed selection, there is a phrase that's being promoted called flag the technology, and uh, you're endorsing this, aren't you? Yeah, so, you know, it's not a new system at all, but really what it comes down to, Eric, is making sure that you have communicated with all of the necessary parties, with your neighbors, with your custom applicators, um, with regards to what technology you're using, particularly um, in Kansas, we're thinking about technology and soybean, herbicide resistance technology and soybeans. You know, one of the things to think about, not only do we have the enlist versus extend trade-off there, we also have extend and extend flex soybeans. If you try to use Liberty and extend soybeans, you will be very disappointed with the outcome. Um, so I just, I I have some concerns because I know there are still some extend soybeans that are out there. And I just have some concerns about folks, you know, again, we're going to be doing a lot of things in a hurry right. here in the next month or so. And, and that's when we make mistakes. And so just, you know, going back and double checking and communicating with folks about what's planted where is going to be really important, I think. That's part of good stewardship unto itself. That's right. Good stewardship, just good management. Well, always something happening in this field, of course, and with our recent weather interruptions in planting and then forcing replanting in some cases added uh, more considerations to weed management at this time of the year. Sarah, always a pleasure. We'll have you back soon. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Weed Management Specialist, K-State Research and Extension, Sarah Lancaster with us here. And after the break, we'll let you get to know the three Kansas FFA members who received perhaps the most prestigious recognition from the State Association at the just-concluded Kansas FFA State Convention. That's next, here on Agriculture Today. Agriculture Today continues now. The 93rd Kansas FFA State Convention was held the latter part of last week, again this year in virtual format. Still, the high achievements of numerous Kansas FFA members and chapters were duly recognized, headlined by the Stars Over Kansas. Each year, district-level winners in the Star Farmer, Star in Agribusiness, and Star in Agricultural Placement categories vie for the state award in each. And here are the three outstanding young people who were selected. The Kansas FFA State Star Farmer this year is from the Valley Heights chapter in north central Kansas, Wesley Denton, who is fully engaged in his registered cattle enterprise. So my farming operation began when I was three years old when my grandparents gave me my first heifer, um, and it slowly progressed over time as I've shown heifers out of um, my grandpa's herd and bought those calves from him, and um, and then uh, once they're done with their show career, they return to my herd. And at the beginning of my freshman year in high school, I was started with 19 cows in my SAE, and it's slowly grown to 31 cows and 14 replacement heifers. This is a uh, registered Hereford operation. Uh, my family has had Herefords ever since my uh, great-grandpa started the farm many, many years ago, and um, we've continued that operation with registered Hereford cattle. Then, as you've experienced this growth in your herd, what have been the more challenging decisions that you've had to make? Uh, some of the more challenging decisions I've had to make is uh, um, selling cattle uh, in my family's on-target bull sale. We have an annual on-target bull sale on which cattle to put in there and which ones to keep back in my herd as um, we sell replacement heifers in that sale as well as some cow-calf pairs, depending on the year, and uh, I've always struggled with decision on whether I should keep them or put some of them in sale um, as the main means of my operation is to help make some money for myself to go to college at Kansas State University. And so it's always um, been a challenge kind of deciding which bulls I want to sale and uh, which replacement heifers I put in the sale, yearling heifers or uh, cow-calf pairs. So you've had some experience in making genetic decisions for this registered herd. Yes, sir. For our, my family's on target bull sale, the uh, majority of our buyers are commercial operations, and uh, they pay a lot of attention to CED, which is calving ease direct, and a little bit of birth weight, and then they like a good spread and high uh, weaning weight because that's when they sell their 
calves is that weaning, so they want a lot of growth in those up until weaning, and so then they can get a um, a good sale when they take them to the whether they take them to a feedlot or they're taking them to the sale barn, whatever they choose to do. Um, and so that's what I look a lot for uh, with the commercial side of things um, for our bull sales. But I also pay a lot of attention to uh, phenotype, especially in the show industry. Phenotype is a huge thing, but I still uh, pay attention to genotype with that um, and making sure that we don't have a super large uh, birth weight or low calving yeast direct. And one expects that you would be also involved in herd health management. Yeah, uh, we do a lot of things for our herd and uh, herd health program, and uh, we vaccinate for IBR and BVD, which is a respiratory disease caused by infectious bovine uh, rhinotracheitis. Um, we also use stay bread to prevent vibriosis, and we also treat for lebto and black leg every other spring for our cows and all calves at weaning. Um, we also recently started a pink eye vaccine recommended by our local veterinarian, Dr. Musil. And then we also use Preguard 10, which is used to help prevent abortions from IBR, uh, Dectamax poron in the spring and fall to prevent parasites internally and externally as well. Wesley Denton of the Valley Heights FFA, Kansas FFA Star Farmer for 2021. The state star in agribusiness hails from the Hugoton FFA in southwest Kansas, Jay McClure. Now, Jay is into the commercial hay business in a big way. My SAE involves a quarter share in a baler on our family farm. My uh, SAE got started back in 2018 when my dad asked if I wanted to invest some of my earnings into the farm so I could start building capital. So I said yes, and we went out and bought a square baler to bale our own alfalfa hay. Prior to 2018, we were having all of our circles custom baled, and the custom guy was, he was doing an all right job, but maybe not quite up to our expectations and we wanted to keep things in-house a little bit more. So that's kind of how my SAE got started. Since then, I have learned a lot about baling hay, service and maintenance on balers, knotter systems, just all kinds of information, mechanical stuff. It's been a learning curve for sure. (laughs) For an idea here of the scope of the operation, how much hay are you putting up in any given season? Last year we did... 5,800 bales. It was a little bit of a dry year. And then in 2021, we put in another circle of hay. So we're going to be right around 7,000, 7,500 bales. So we run with the other circle we added last fall. I think we're at 825 acres for 2021 of alfalfa hay. And then we've planted some oats and such here this spring that we will bale off later in the summer. And do you use the hay in-house in your own operation, or do you market it? So all of our hay is marketed either through a broker or private treaty. I would say 75% of it is marketed through a broker. It stays fairly local, within 150 miles of home. And then we have sent some hay to Kentucky on a private treaty deal to feed racehorses. As far as the business side of it, have you been involved in that to any extent at this point, Jay? Yeah, quite a bit. So on anything we look at investing in, my dad and I will go over a budget plan on how it's going to get ROI back to the farm and either how it's going to save money or save us time because in our operation, time is money. You can never have enough time, and it doesn't seem like you can ever have enough money. So we'll go over balance sheets and spreadsheets on things to make sure they're going to pan out before we invest in them. Jay McClure of the Hugoton FFA, Kansas FFA star in agribusiness for 2021. And the state star in agricultural placement is fully immersed in the family farm concept. She is Nicole Hazy of the Ellsworth FFA chapter. 
I have two different placement SAEs. Assisting with my dad's farming operation and working for my grandfather's operation, assisting my dad is a barter for pasture rent and feed for my cow calf and 4-H deer. Working for my grandfather comes first, as I am his only paid hired hand. I work on weekends, summer break, and days off from school. I work around 500 head of cattle and over 2,500 acres of farmland, where main crops are milo and wheat. The tasks I perform vary from operating the grain cart, working ground in preparation for the next season's crop, swathing feed in hay meadows, and gathering, sorting, and working cattle. I prepare machinery for operation by greasing, checking oil level and tire pressure, and filling with fuel. I assist with fixing machines when broke down and am typically the person sent to town to pick up parts. During summer months, I am in charge of checking pastures for thistles, fixing fence, and making sure all cattle are accounted for and in good health. If I am not doing a task involving machinery or cattle work, I take part in whatever task is asked of me. For my dad, my main duties happen in the winter and spring, where we mainly focus on cattle work and fence building, along with maintenance and upgrading of machinery. Summer is when I put in the most hours for my grandfather, due to working Monday through Sunday with most days over eight hours. I have a passion for agriculture and love being able to work in the agriculture industry. You have a busy agenda working for both your father and your grandfather then. That's pretty obvious. Do either of them or both of them allow you to carry out your own decision making at some point or the other, depending on the task? Definitely depending on the task. When it comes to anything field-wise, I go through them to make sure I'm doing everything right. But when it comes to some cattle decisions, it's up to me to make the decision when I'm out in the summer pasture by myself and need to determine if something needs fixed on the fence or something like that. But I will, if I see cattle that is not in good health, I go through them. You've gained something from this experience, obviously. What primarily have you learned from it? I have learned that hard work pays off. If you want to accomplish a task, you have to put in the work. And I have found that the harder you work, the more accomplished you will feel in the end. Nicole Hazy of the Ellsworth FFA, the state star in agricultural placement this year. Our congratulations to all and to the new Kansas FFA state officer team for 2021-22. Sentinel Josie Schmidt of the Greeley County FFA. Reporter Lydia Watanabe of the Arkansas City chapter. Treasurer Jocelyn Dvorak of the Hiawatha FFA. The State Secretary, Eric Peterson, of the Clifton Clyde Chapter. The Vice President, Rachel Sebesta, of the Ellsworth FFA. And the 2021-22 Kansas FFA State President, from the Neodache Chapter, Ashley Chandler. This is Agriculture Today. Broadcasting from the Kansas State University campus, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And now today's agricultural news headlines, beginning with the Crop Progress and Condition Report for the state of Kansas. Out from the USDA and for the week ending this past Sunday, our topsoil moisture supplies were at 15% surplus, yet 81% adequate and only 4% short to very short. Subsoil moisture at 12% surplus and 80% adequate, 8% short to very short. The condition of the Kansas winter wheat crop is at 65%, good to excellent now, significantly up, Uh, 25% fair and 10% poor to very poor. Winter wheat coloring now 49%, the average for the date is 59%, and wheat now called mature is at 2%. Condition of the corn crop in the state, 76%, good to excellent, 19% fair, 5% poor to very poor. Corn planting is 90% complete now, that's very near the average, and emergence is at 74%, that's slightly behind the 83% average. Soybean crop condition, 66% good to excellent, 29% fair, and 5% poor to very poor. Soybeans planted now at 68%, that's ahead of the 62% average, 
an emergence of beans at 49 percent, ahead of the 43 percent average. Grain sorghum condition in the state, 73 percent good to excellent, 25 percent fair, 2 percent poor to very poor, with sorghum planting at 30 percent complete. Now that is behind the 37 percent average. And range and pasture conditions in the state, 75 percent good to excellent this week, 21 percent fair, and 4 percent poor to very poor. For a glance at the corn and soybean conditions nationally now, we turn it over to the USDA's Stephanie Ho. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey has the latest look at condition ratings for the nation's corn crop. We did see some adverse weather moving into parts of the upper Midwest in the form of hot weather late in the week, and it did take a bit of a nip out of the early condition rating that was quite good last week. So the number for June 6th coming in now at 72 percent, good to excellent. That is down four percentage points from last week. He also notes a one point increase in the very poor to poor rating from a week ago. Still very early. Early in the season, a lot can happen, so just keep that in mind as we move forward. He also has this season's first look at soybean conditions. Nationally, just about two-thirds, or 67 percent, of the soybeans rated in good to excellent condition. Six percent, very poor to poor. And like corn, that is just a bit below where we were at this time a year ago when we were seeing 72 percent good to excellent and just four percent, very poor to poor. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Also, winter wheat conditions nationally at 50% good to excellent. That was up two percentage points from the previous week, down one point from a year ago. Higher winter wheat ratings for not only Kansas, but Texas, Missouri, Colorado. Declines for Montana, Arkansas, Michigan, Illinois, Washington State, and South Dakota. Now, spring wheat condition fell again last week to only 38% good to excellent, down 5% from the previous week, and that crop's current rating the lowest for this time of year since 1988. And nationally, grain sorghum 52% planted, that's 7% behind the average. And the USDA will spend more than $4 billion to focus on diversifying critical supply chains after lessons learned from the pandemic and will tie at least part of that funding to transforming livestock markets. According to the department, the initiative looking to leverage billions more in investments by the private sector to, again, transform critical parts of the U.S. food system, in the USDA's words, and shift away from heavy reliance on a small number of large processors. Coming your way now, this week's edition of Milk Lines. Here's K-State Dairy Specialist, Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers, and actually just with everyone, about the importance of the dairy industry to the United States as well as here in Kansas. You know, June is dairy month, and we're in the thick of it, and just thought it might be good to remind people of how important our dairy industry is. As we look at it on a national basis, the dairy industry produces, in terms of gross domestic product, about $628 billion annually. In addition, there's about 3 million U.S. jobs that are associated with the dairy industry. About 1 million of those would be direct on farms and direct in producing milk, and about 2 million would be indirect jobs. Those jobs generate about $150 billion in wages. On an export basis, it might be surprising for most of you, but about one out of every seven gallons of milk that we produce here in the United States, the amount of that product actually is for exports. So we export on an annual basis about $5.5 billion worth of dairy product. And if you look at this on since 1995, it's been a growth rate of about 604%. So tremendous growth in dairy exports since 1995. How about here in Kansas? Well, here in Kansas, we have about 320 active dairy farms. Those dairy farms produce about 742 million in direct revenue and a total of about 1.2 billion in total revenue. Jobs generated, about 1,300 direct jobs on our dairy farms, with a total of about 4,200 utilized in the rest of the industry. As we look at our exports here in the state of Kansas, annually we're exporting in the state of Kansas about $102 million worth of product. 
as you think about economic development here in the state, every time we add a thousand head of dairy cattle to our dairy herd here in the state, that generates annually about 5.5 million in economic benefits. And in many of our communities, those economic dollars generated by those dairies will circulate around the community about seven times. So hats off to our dairy farmers. June is Dairy Month. It's time for us to recognize that the toil that they spend seven days a week, 365 or 66 days of year caring for those animals are very important to providing us with wholesome, safe, nutritious dairy products on our shelves. Remember back in April when you went to the grocery store and you found that many of those favorite dairy products that you normally would purchase weren't on the shelves? Well, thank your dairy farmers that today those products are back on the shelf and they are available. So take time to say thanks to dairy farmers that you might know. And if you don't know any dairy farmers, maybe you have one that's a neighbor that you've never stopped in to visit, take a minute, just stop by and thank them for the work that they put in every day on our behalf. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. An important message to share there, Mike. Many thanks. And we'll return with more after this break. You're listening to Agriculture Today. We're back now on Agriculture Today and across the way once more for his weekly visit about wildlife management, former K-State Research and Extension Wildlife Specialist Charlie Lee. Charlie, we've been talking about research and other aspects concerning rodenticides lately, and you wanted to pass along word about a specific rodenticide product which seems by its definition to hold promise, but there are some hang-ups. Tell us what this compound is, first of all. Well, the rodenticide is called norbormide. It's an acute-acting toxicant that is selective for rats. It's, so it's rat-specific. It causes vasoconstriction or narrowing of the small arteries and vasodilation, which is widening of the large arteries in rats. So that results in a rapid fall in blood pressure and death probably results from circulatory disorders and heart failure. It is unique in that it is specific to rats. Mm -hmm. It's highly toxic to rats compared to other mammals or birds. Rats are a hundred times uh, more sensitive to norbormide than house mice and 40 times more sensitive to norbormide than guinea pigs. And those would be the two species that are closest to rats in toxicity to this product. It's virtually non-toxic to companion animals, cats, dogs, and to humans. It has uh, no antidote, and no antidote is required. This is seemingly an ideal prospect for rat control. Oddly, though, it's been around for, what, some 50 years? Yeah, it's been around uh, since the early 60s. It was first synthesized as a product that might be used for anti-rheumatic drug. It seemed to have very doubtful value for that purpose, but it was then further researched as an appetite suppressant in initially in house mice and then in cats. But when they tried it with rats, the difference in susceptibility was very striking and that was first thought that they had made a, a major error somewhere along the way. However, they re- did the experiments in the mid-60s and uh, confirmed that when the, the experiments were repeated, they got the same results. Then it was uh, first introduced to the, the public uh, as a rare species-specific rodenticide and marketed as radicate and shoxin. And then the use of it declined rather dramatically in the 1970s as anticoagulants became more popular. And some of the problems with it is the taste aversion has kind of limited the effectiveness of it because rats simply don't consume it readily. Thus, if they don't consume it, field efficacy 
results are generally poor. So there's been a, some redevelopment of the product, trying to get rats to accept the bait and further reduce some of the problems with it. Uh, there are several things that are makes an ideal rodenticide, and one is that it has to be specifically lethal to the target species. It needs to be relatively humane. Uh, it's best if it's orally active and readily absorbed and have relatively short half-lives in blood and tissues versus other rodenticides. does not need to be persistent in the environment and does not lead to secondary poisoning and no antidote required. This checks all the boxes, doesn't it? Yes, it seems to. if you have to use a rodenticide, this seems to be a pretty ideal product, but it's very specific for rats. Are then scientists who are trying to revive this product, so to say, working on that palatability issue? Are they making headway there at all? Well, there are some uh, positive results there. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of this is now tied up in commercial applications, um, and yet not made available to public and, and not had wide-scale trials yet. I think that it has lots of potential, but there still needs to be additional research, and there is certainly a group or two groups, actually, in New Zealand that are investing some time, funds, in trying to reduce some of the problems using the product. Their current experiments show that some of the problems are are with the manufacturing of the product itself. Different manufacturers seem to have different efficacy and different effectiveness with the norboramide product. And until they find out which one of those manufacturers has a, a consistent product, uh, they're probably going to continue to struggle. But they seem to have a manufacturer picked out that appears to be a product that's very effective and perhaps a little bit better accepted by some rodents. There's also been some work on encapsulation of bitter tasting products. Micro encapsulation has been used uh, for a long time in other products for other purposes. And it seems like if they can get the product encapsulated in something that hides the taste or the smell, maybe they can get a little bit more acceptance and, and it would allow to delay the action of the toxicant since it's a very acute acting product. Once uh, rats see their buddies come to the product, uh, sometimes they turn away. And that's been one of the reasons that the anticoagulants have been so successful is that it's a slow acting product. It's well accepted by most all species of rodents, but unfortunately there's been some primary and secondary hazards associated with some of those products. And I think it's time that we continue to look for new products. So if the hang-ups with this norbormide can be overcome, this could be a significant answer to the off-target issues that we've spoken of before. Yeah, the, the group suggests that at the current rate of development or redevelopment, it's expected that new forms of norbormide could be registered and available for field use within the next few years. With any luck, it'll turn out to be a premier rodenticide product that will once again be benign to everything but the target species, in this case rats. It's called norbormide. Thanks for reporting on this today, Charlie. Charlie Lee, longtime wildlife specialist with K-State Research and Extension. He's along with us every Tuesday right here. Our time's away once again. Thanks for joining us, and we'll be right back here this same time tomorrow and hope you will be as well. Until then, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.